Hello everyone, uh, Papa is here, uh, look, uh, Captain Marvel is here, Captain America is here. Normally, uh, when your professor speaks to you, I've got Spider-Man behind me, but, but today, I've got a special treat with uh, two mighty Avengers. And so we've got, we, we've got uh, Captain America, uh, show, show them your shield. There we go. It's the biggest thing ever. I don't know how I carry it. <laughs> it is a big shield for uh, for uh, Conrad, Captain America. I just made it through the laundry room. <laughs> all right. No and how. all right. And over here we have Captain Marvel uh, saluting and uh, look at her attire. She's fresh from the cosmos. And Captain Marvel, show them your flirkin. Ah, all right, one more time. Okay, very good. Well, I just wanted to send y'all a greeting, and uh, in just a moment, we'll begin our uh, lecture on uh, for uh, persecution and martyrdom. So y'all, hang on just a moment. I want to begin our story of persecution and and martyrdom at the very beginning because we see it even as early as the New Testament when our Lord Jesus Christ gave warnings to his disciples and through them to us about coming persecution. Let's look at uh, Jesus' warning in Matthew 24, 9 through 14. You can see in this illustration that Jesus and his disciples are up on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Valley of Kidron, and they can see the temple below. Just ahead of uh, this passage, uh, the disciples uh, remarked to Jesus about the magnificence of the temple, and truly it was a magnificent structure, one of the wonders of the world. But Jesus told to them, Do you see uh, this building? I tell you that one day not one stone will stand on another. And indeed, this prophecy came true in 70 AD when uh, the Romans uh, squelched the uh, Jewish revolt, laid siege to Jerusalem, uh, broke through the walls and destroyed the city and tore down the temple so that indeed not one stone was left standing on another. But Jesus had more to say about persecution and he warned that it would uh, continue until the end times. So I'm going to read to you from Matthew 24 uh, starting with verse 9. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, betray one another, and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. All right, the key word there for us is testimony, uh, because there will be a testimony during persecution. And the word testimony comes from the Greek word marturion. Uh, the root word of that is martus. Martus is a word uh, that means witness, and it could be used of someone who was a witness in a trial, or someone who was a witness to uh, historical events. Uh, but in the Christian world, it took on a very specific uh, meaning as one who witnesses to faith in Jesus Christ, even to the point of death. And so, uh, the, the question I want to ask is, who was the first Christian 
martyr recorded in the New Testament? And of course, the answer is Stephen, and you see him uh, illustrated there. We can learn a lot about persecution and martyrdom from the story of Stephen. And so now I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 6, uh, which is the passage that introduces Stephen along with uh, six other uh, early Christians that, uh, that perhaps uh, give us the pattern of later deacons. But Stephen is described uh, in uh, chapter 6, verse 8, as uh, full of grace and power. And Stephen was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from some members of the Freedmen's Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia. And they began to argue with Stephen, but they were unable to stand up against his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. So notice that uh, Stephen uh, was presenting the gospel uh, at a synagogue known as the Freedman Synagogue, and uh, some of the members of the synagogue came from Cilicia. All right, here is an interesting bit of Bible trivia. Uh, what was the capital of Cilicia? Well, it was Tarsus. Do we know someone who came from Tarsus? Yes, Saul of Tarsus. And so it seems evident that Saul was an active member of this synagogue. Uh, he heard Stephen's arguments about Jesus the Christ. Uh, he refuted them, argued with him, and was part of the group that brought Stephen before the Sanhedrin. So before the Sanhedrin, uh, Stephen presented his defense, and his defense was a tour de force uh, a, a trip through the history of uh, Israel. And at the end of his uh, testimony, he uh, turned on the Sanhedrin, saying, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit, as your ancestors did, you do also. Uh, which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. So he's accusing them, uh, the Sanhedrin, of having betrayed and murdered the righteous one for whom they had been looking. All right. Now, uh, when the Sanhedrin heard these things, uh, they were enraged. They gnashed their teeth at him. But uh, listen to what Stephen said. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Normally, when we picture Jesus uh, in a certain posture uh, in heaven, we think of him as being seated at the right hand of God. And yet Stephen saw Jesus standing. It is as if Jesus rose out of his seat in order to come and welcome Stephen into heaven as a victorious, honored martyr. So the Sanhedrin, when they heard this, they yelled, they covered their ears, they rushed against him and dragged him out of the city, uh, beginning to stone him. And notice who is close by. Uh, they laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. All right, so Saul is close by. He is seeing the death of Stephen. He's hearing Stephen's last words. And Stephen called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then Stephen knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. All right, so uh, we see that Stephen is giving his testimony. 
he is being a true uh, martyr, a true witness uh, to Jesus Christ. Even at the time of his death, he is witnessing. Saul is hearing. This is going to have an impact on Saul. So often, uh, the, the martyr gives a witness that has an impact even on the persecutor. All right. Continuing on in uh, Acts chapter 8, Saul agreed with putting Stephen to death, and on that day a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. All right, you remember uh, at the very first chapter of Acts, Acts 1, 8, Jesus gives a commission. He says to uh, his disciples that you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth all right and so uh, this is a fulfillment of Jesus' command that, uh, that they would leave Jerusalem and go to Judea and Samaria. And I think that Luke has composed his history uh, well uh, in, uh, in following uh, the outline that Jesus uh, gave in Acts 1.8. So, the disciples scatter into Judea and Samaria, spreading the gospel. All right, uh, but um, we see that Saul continues to persecute the church. All right, in uh, eight three it says Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house and drag off men and women and put them into prison. Now, we often debate the role of women in the church. We debate what offices they can hold, what women can and cannot do. And yet, here in the scripture, we see there's one office that always has been open to women, and that is uh, the office of martyr. Because even in the New Testament, we see women being dragged off uh, to prison. We, uh, in the early church, we see that women suffer uh, martyrdom. They suffer death because of their witness to Jesus Christ. Uh, later on in the Reformation, Anabaptist women will suffer. And around the world today, we read about women, faithful Christians, who suffer and indeed die for their faith in Jesus Christ. So, we've already learned a couple of principles about persecution. Uh, one is that women are persecuted alongside men. Another principle is that when persecution comes, the church scatters and spreads the gospel. And then the third is that the martyr's witness can have an impact even upon the persecutors. All right, so next we're going to uh, read about uh, Saul and uh, his next adventure. He uh, w was so uh, hateful toward the Christians that he requested letters from the high priest to travel to Damascus, uh, there to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem for prosecution. But what happens on his trip is so dramatic that even today, we refer to a dramatic conversion experience as a Damascus Road experience. So, he, uh, as, as Saul is traveling and uh, nears Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that he did not say, uh, why are you persecuting the men and women of Jerusalem? He did not say, why are you persecuting the believers 
in Damascus. He said, why are you persecuting me? And so this is another principle of persecution, and that is that Jesus suffers with us and also uh, that we are united with Christ in our suffering. Another principle is that persecution is always aimed at Jesus. All right, and we'll learn more about that in just a minute. Well, to continue on with our story, uh, uh, Saul says, who are you, Lord? And uh, Jesus says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. All right, so Saul uh, was converted, all right? And uh, then he began to uh, preach the gospel. He reached out to Christians in Damascus and then in Jerusalem. And, of course, they were uh, surprised by this, uh, this conversion and doubted him. But uh, one a friend that he made in Jerusalem was uh, uh, Barnabas. And so uh, Barnabas is going to play an important role in uh, Saul's future as a Christian. Next, I want to turn our attention to Acts 11, and we're going to pick up at the place where we were in Acts 8, uh, 1 through 3. Uh, Luke continues his narrative by saying, Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen, all right, so the, the persecution begun by Saul against the Christians, uh, scattered the Christians, and they made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Uh, and at first they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But there were some who went to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, to the Gentiles also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. All right, And so we, are, we will see that Antioch becomes a major Christian center, not only in the New Testament, but even beyond. Uh, we, uh, we'll, we know the story of Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch. Uh, later on, Antioch will become one of the four major centers of Christianity and uh, will produce many of the leaders of the church like John Chrysostom and others. So Antioch uh, will play a major role in the church, not only in New Testament times, but even through the early centuries of the church. And notice, the church began because of persecution in Jerusalem, which scattered the believers to uh, the north, uh, to, uh, to Syria, to Antioch, and then beyond. The church at Antioch was so large, and because of the Gentiles uh, that were uh, converting, the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas there to, uh, to examine what's going on. And when Barnabas saw the great work there, he rejoiced, but he realized that he needs help in pastoring this church in Antioch. And so who does he go to? Who does he send for? He goes to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And they, uh, they met with the church and taught large numbers. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. This was not a compliment. Uh, it's a word that means little Christs. And uh, so because Christ was a crucified criminal, uh, the people who called them Christians really were mocking them. But today, it is a name that we bear in honor. Well, what's interesting to me is that Saul persecuted the church in Jerusalem, the disciples scattered, they founded a church in Antioch, and then eventually Saul came to be a pastor of this church. I think that's, that's an amazing uh, irony, a turn of events, 
that God orchestrated and that just shows that we serve a God with a sense of humor. All right. And so Saul converted. Uh, he and Barnabas were commissioned by the church in Antioch to go out from there uh, to, uh, to uh, extend the gospel through the first missionary journey. And on that journey, uh, Saul uh, took on the name Paul. Probably his uh, Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Roman name. He uh, uh, used the name Paul in order to uh, relate to the people that he was uh, ministering to. But nonetheless, uh, Saul the persecutor became Paul the persecuted. And you can see the story of his persecutions in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Thus far, we have been looking at persecution against the church at the hands of the Jews. But uh, eventually, the Romans turned their attention to the Christians. Uh, eventually, the Romans began to understand that Christianity was a separate new religion apart from uh, Judaism. And so, um, uh, they began to persecute the Christians uh, on their uh, as as an individual separate group the first persecution instigated by uh, the emperor was done under the rule of nero nero reigned from 51 to 68 and toward the end of his reign in the year 64 fire destroyed much of the city of rome now, the rumor was spread that Nero had ordered the fire uh, to make room for his new city, Neuropolis. He wanted to level the old city and rebuild the city uh, in his name, uh, the city of Nero. Uh, also, Nero was, uh, was quite crazy, uh, and he fancied himself a musician and an artist. And so he had written a... Uh, a, a song about the fall of Troy and he felt that if he burned the city he could uh, play his lyre and sing the song and as he watched Rome burn. Uh, you can see the illustration on this slide is from the movie Quo Vadis. and so you will see this scene being played out on the film. But uh, the, uh, as the rumor spread that Nero was the incendiary, uh, then uh, Nero had to deflect the blame elsewhere. And so he used Christians as scapegoats and he executed hundreds. The uh, Roman historian Tacitus, about 60 years later, told the story of how uh, Nero uh, had hundreds arrested, placed in prison, and then he would put them on display uh, at his circus on his own personal uh, 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 grounds. Uh, he would invite the citizens to come and watch the spectacle. He would uh, dress the Christians in animal skins, and they would be attacked by wild dogs. Uh, at night, he would have them crucified. He'd have the Christians covered with tar and, uh, and, and set a fire. And so the, uh, the Nero and his entourage would eat their banquet at night by the light of burning Christians. This was, uh, this was a terrible, terrible uh, persecution. And uh, again, it's reported by the uh, a Roman historian. It was during this persecution that uh, Simon Peter uh, was uh, was martyred. This is, of course, not recorded in the the Bible, uh, but uh, and and the histories are uncertain, and yet they are plentiful enough that uh, I'm quite convinced that Simon Peter was martyred under Nero's persecution. Now, according to tradition, he was crucified upside down. 
Now, this story is uh, quite questionable, but it does give us uh, an, an, uh, uh, a legend that fires the imagination that uh, Simon Peter, when he was told he would be crucified, he said, I am not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord. Uh, and so he was crucified in a different manner, that is, upside down. But let's see what Simon Peter uh, had to say about persecution in his first letter. He said to his audience, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice what Peter says, and he uh, emphasizes a principle that we have observed before. He says, your adversary is the devil. Your adversary is not uh, Nero. It's not the Roman Empire. Your adversary is the devil who is uh, prowling like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. All right. And so the principle here uh, is that the devil lies behind all religious violence. The devil's anger is directed at Christ. And this uh, this word comes from a book, uh, Faith That Endures, written by Ronald Boyd McMillan, who is someone who uh, is a, uh, a student of persecution. This is why Jesus says to his disciples and to us that we should uh, love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us uh, because uh, our persecutors are not our enemy. It is Satan who is our enemy. And often the persecutors are uh, victims of Satan's wrath just as much as those who are persecuted. And so Jesus says, look beyond the persecutors to understand that Satan is the author of persecution and love your persecutors. Because uh, as we're going to see in many stories from early Christian persecution, often the persecutors come to faith in Christ because of the witness of those who are suffering. So, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, according to tradition, also uh, was, uh, was executed during Nero's persecution. However, uh, he was beheaded. Why do you think he was beheaded? Because he was a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen would not be subject to uh, wild animals or crucifixion. Beheading was a nobler uh, execution. And so uh, the story goes that he was beheaded in Rome. His last uh, letter, his last writing, uh, we call 2 Timothy. And in chapter 3, verse 12, he wrote, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All right, and so there is an expectation among Christians that we will be persecuted. Now, there are three principles of Christian persecution that are put forward by Nick Ripkin, who is the author of The Insanity of God, uh, a, uh, a missionary who suffered himself, as well as one who has researched and interviewed uh, uh, persecuted peoples around the world. He says that biblically, persecution is normal. The number one cause of persecution is people turning to Jesus. Therefore, obedience to the Great Commission will bring about persecution and suffering. The converse is that if we are not uh, being persecuted, it may be because we are not being obedient to the Great Commission. Returning to Ronald Boyd McMillan, 
in Faith That Endures, he says that Western Christians require an encounter with the persecuted church in order to recover essential insights into their own faith, especially the biblical truth that there is no such thing as a non-persecuted believer. All right, and so uh, even in the West, uh, we experience persecution. It is a different kind of persecution. He goes on to say, just because I live in a free country does not make the devil less interested in stealing my worship away from Jesus Christ. And so it seems to me that uh, even in the West, where we do not face persecution in the same way that others do around the world, we identify with Christians around the world and share in their persecution. And we need to be aware of the more subtle persecution that is taking place even in our country, which uh, supposedly is a free country. All right, moving on to the next major uh, persecution, uh, we will say that, uh, that persecution ended with Nero's death in 68. But then uh, later on, another emperor named Domitian rose up and he reigned from 81 to 96. By this time, emperors who died were considered divine after death. But Domitian was the first emperor who demanded worship during his own lifetime. And he uh, demanded that the residents of the Roman Empire assemble in each uh, city square and burn a, a pinch of incense or pour out a bit of wine and speak the uh, confession, Caesar es curios, Caesar is Lord. Christians, of course, would not make such a confession because uh, they confess that Jesus es curios, Jesus is Lord. As Paul wrote in the letter to Romans, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Well, the Christians' refusal to worship Domitian instigated the persecution that was the background to the book of Revelation. Now, we need to understand that uh, persecution during the first uh, centuries was never universal, that is, was never practiced everywhere, and it was not constant, but it was uh, sporadic and intermittent. And so the persecution under Domitian was focused on Rome, Domitian's headquarters, and also uh, focused in Asia Minor, what we now call Turkey. Because in 17 AD, a great earthquake destroyed many of the cities in northern Asia Minor. And the emperor Tiberius took funds out of the imperial treasury in order to rebuild the cities. And so in Asia Minor, the emperor was revered and anyone refusing to participate in the imperial cult would be persecuted. And so we see persecution uh, is the heaviest in Asia Minor, particularly in cities such as Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These cities, of course, are familiar to us because we have read the book of Revelation, where Jesus uh, dictates letters to these cities to the Apostle John, who then passes them on. The Apostle John is exiled to the island of Patmos. John, of course, uh, would refuse to worship the emperor, but because of his age, he was not um, uh, executed, but instead was exiled to the copper mine of Patmos, where he had this great vision 
and wrote letters to the churches back in Asia Minor. Of course, uh, John was the pastor of a church in Ephesus. He had uh, left Jerusalem, uh, if not during the persecution under Agrippa in Acts 12, uh, then surely by the time of the Jewish revolt, uh, he left and settled in Ephesus. Now, one of the letters was written to the church in Smyrna, and uh, Smyrna is another church that we will read about in early church history. Uh, but uh, at this time, Smyrna was a very faithful church and facing severe persecution. But Jesus, through John, says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. All right. Uh, Jesus promises to give those who are faithful until death the crown of life. That is your key word of the day. All right. Crown of life. And so if you, uh, if you hear uh, this uh, lecture and attend to it, then please send me an email with the key word crown of life. All right, Ronald Boyd McMillan uh, says that we must encounter the persecuted, see the great God at work, grow in faith and boldness, and as a result, enjoy the faith that endures to change the world. All right, and so uh, it is our uh, responsibility, it is our privilege uh, to participate in persecution globally by praying for those. And so uh, please let us remember uh, to pray for the persecuted church around the world. And so here are our responses to persecution. One, we expect persecution. As Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, we rejoice in persecution. Uh, Jesus uh, speaks to those who are hated, who are excluded, who are insulted and who are rejected for uh, Jesus' uh, name. He says that we should rejoice in persecution. We endure persecution, as we just read in Revelation 2.10, and also we pray during persecution. We pray for the persecutors, as we read in Matthew 5.44, and we pray for the persecuted. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in his second letter, chapter 3, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread quickly and be held in honor just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone holds to the faith. I want to mention... Uh, one resource in particular, you see on the on this slide in the lower right corner, persecution.com. This is a website that is sponsored by the Voice of the Martyrs. The Voice of the Martyrs speaks for the persecuted church around the world. It was founded by a man named uh, Richard Vermbrand, who himself was persecuted in Romania. Uh, by the communists because he was a Christian pastor and uh, he he was ransomed by Christians he was brought to America and here he uh, indeed was a voice for martyrs around the world if you will uh, go to the website persecution.com uh, you can read there stories of uh, suffering around the world and you will then know better how to pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering for the sake of Jesus and in so doing we uh, identify ourselves with the persecuted church 
and we ourselves uh, will share in their persecution and their suffering. All right, thank you for hanging with me during this uh, lecture on persecution in the New Testament. And uh, this is kind of a, a prequel to the video I sent out earlier on persecution at the turn of the second century. I have other videos to record and send out in hopes that in this way, we can somehow keep up with the task that is ahead of us in learning early church history, even despite our being uh, separated during this uh, time of evacuation. So blessings upon you all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, seeing my grandchildren, Conrad and Lucy, uh, as, uh, as Captain America and as Captain Marvel. You can see that wherever I go, uh, uh, I, Marvel is there, all right, because it's, uh, it's a fun part of my life. Thank you for sharing that with me. Blessings to all. Bye-bye.